Can you test for a mind? This is all about the Voigtkampf test from Blade Runner. I've been wanting to talk about this for a very long time. I kind of love to talk about Blade Runner in general anyway. I love to talk about Philip K. Dick because he's genuinely one of my favourite authors, even if his stuff is so dystopian and pretty depressing. I think the reason I find it depressing is because I find it very believable. You know, like I really genuinely feel like it's one of the best depictions of where we could go as society with the development of technology and like how people would react and respond and behave. Which when you read his books leads to being kind of like, oh, that's actually a pretty, pretty, pretty pessimistic view of the future you got there, which uh, yeah, it's pretty true. Okay. But Blade Runner, we know one of the greatest original, um, not original, that's not the word I'm looking for, but I'm thinking like kind of classic sci-fi, but then classic sci-fi depends on, I guess, what, what your era is. So, but Blade Runner is an iconic movie, right? And Blade Runner 2049 was an incredible continuation of that original story. Now, I've kind of spoken before about like how, how we deal with or understand or appreciate adaptations. We have to see them in the context of, of what the medium that they're being told in is. Certain things read better and then you have to kind of change it around for it to visually read better, if that makes sense. So there are things that were missing in the Blade Runner movie that were in the original book that I would love to see and I would love to see an adaptation or a different take on the adaptation. But the Blade Runner version of it is, as I said, it's iconic. It's great characterization of Deckard from um, Harrison Ford. And it brought us the one of these sci-fi tools that we just love to see. I mean, you know the way there's just certain visuals that you're just like, oh, it's just such an iconic visual of like a prop. So we are gonna talk, like I said, about the Voigtkampf test and what it actually is doing in the movie and kind of how we can connect it to what's happening in the world right now when we talk about AI and not necessarily androids, but maybe someday in the future. So let's get into it. Oh, before I do, uh, like, subscribe, do all the things to uh, get involved with this video, please and thank you. So what was the Voigtkampf test and what was it supposed to do? Now, in the original Blade Runner, the Voigtkampf test is the standard for identifying replicants. It doesn't do things like check fingerprints or look for serial numbers. It doesn't test for intelligence, for strength, for logic. It's testing for empathy. Specifically, it prevents morally or emotionally charged scenarios. So things like watching an animal suffer. And then it looks for involuntary um, physiological reactions. So like eye movement or pupil dilation and the heart rate. This is the kind of stuff that you can't fake. So the logic is pretty simple here. If you're a person, you'll feel something. If you're not, you won't the idea anyway. But can we really look at empathy as a proxy for humanity? Because the reason it works in the world of Blade Runner is that the replicants, which are the early models, they're not supposed to have empathy. They are just tools. They follow their orders. Now they can be clever, they can be persuasive, they can be charming, but they're not supposed to feel for others, not in any deep or spontaneous way. So the test assumes that if you do respond emotionally to suffering, then you are a human. If you don't, you're not. But this raises a deeper problem because what if a replicant can learn to respond? What if it's not empathy that they're missing, but the time to develop it? And what if they can fake empathy so well that we can't tell the difference? Now that problem becomes even clearer when you compare the Voigtkampf test to the Turing test. Do you know what the Turing test is? Yeah, 
I know what the Turing test is. So Alan Turing proposed that if you could talk to a machine through text and you couldn't tell whether it was a human or not, then that machine should be considered intelligent. It's kind of like a behavioral benchmark. It's not a test for awareness, let's be clear. It doesn't ask whether the machine like understands what's being said. It's just whether it can pass as a human in a conversation. But the catch here is that a system can pass the Turing test without having a memory, without having understanding, without having any like inner experience or anything. It just has to be good at imitation. Now, in a way, the Voigtkamp test then is kind of like a response to the Turing test's limitations or like an upgrade or an improvement for it. Because the Turing test looks at imitation, whereas the Voigtkamp test looks for emotion. So instead of checking whether a machine can talk like us, it tries to find out whether there's an emotional response underneath and whether we would be able to recognize it. How many questions does it usually take to spot one? It took more than a hundred for Rachel, didn't it? She doesn't know. So what does it mean for us in the real world? Because even if a system does pass a test like Voigtkamp or Turing, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's like genuine awareness behind it. You see, what we really want to know, it's not just whether something can imitate emotion, it's whether it's actually experiencing it at all. And this is where things might get a little bit trickier. So we can't directly measure consciousness or sentience. We don't know how it arises. So we rely on things like behavior or signals and we look for specific uh, things like emotional reactivity, context sensitive decisions, uh, social feedback and continuity of self over time. There are frameworks like uh, theory of mind, which looks at whether a system can model others' mental states, or there's the mirror test, which tries to identify self-awareness. But both of these have limitations and they are built for biological brains, not silicon or positron ones. Now, in physics, we hit the same kind of a wall here because there's no physical quantity for experience. Like there's no equation that we can write for what it feels like from the inside. We can describe the brain's electrical activity in a lot of detail, but that doesn't tell us like what it's like to be you. With consciousness, we don't even have the equations. We're just watching from the outside and we are trying to guess what's going on inside. So we fall back on proxies. And those proxies get like a bit shaky when we start looking at artificial systems like large language models. These are things that can generate language that sounds thoughtful, that sounds caring, that sounds emotional without having any underlying awareness or experience. Now, researchers in effective computing are developing systems that are able to like read faces, to read tones and gestures, to simulate emotional intelligence. These systems, right, they can detect signs of sadness or joy and they can respond in ways that might feel natural. But again, it's just mimicry. The system itself doesn't actually feel anything. It just knows what's appropriate to say. Something that I noticed recently is that some AI systems are now advertising features like advanced reasoning or visual reasoning. But those terms don't actually mean what it means when we talk about what it is to reason, or it makes us think that we're, that they are thinking logically in depth about their answers. But the terms don't mean that the system is reasoning in the way that a person does. What they do is they describe more complex pattern recognition. So it's looking at statistical prediction, not logic or understanding. 
The language makes it sound like it's cognitive, but it's still fundamentally mimicry. There's no intent, there's no understanding. And that's why how we describe these systems and what we expect from them really matters. So just like the Voigtkampf test, we are still trying to infer conscious experience from behavior. And there's always like the uncomfortable possibility that what feels real to us <laughs> might just be a really good simulation. <laughs> but no, we're not going there. We're not going to simulation hypothesis. Another time, people. Cells. Have you ever been in an institution? Cells. Cells. Do they keep you in a cell? Cells. Cells. When you're not performing your duties, do they keep you in a little box? Cells. Cells. Interlinked. But let's talk about Blade Runner 2049 for a minute. Because by the time we get to this movie, the test has changed. The Voigtkampf is gone. In place, we have the baseline test. And this tells us something new. Because the newer replicants do have feelings. They do show emotional reactivity. So empathy is no longer a reliable boundary in this world. What matters now is whether they can suppress it. The baseline test checks that. It checks, um, it compares a replicant's responses to a fixed emotional profile. And any deviation from that profile, any hesitation or signs of agitation or introspection is a warning sign to the examiners. So we're no longer looking at detecting empathy, we're now enforcing control. Because the baseline test isn't looking for human-like feeling, it's checking for emotional deviation. Signs that a replicant might be thinking too much, feeling too much, or asking questions it shouldn't. And that shift mirrors the real-world anxiety that we have around AI. Not just can it think, but can we trust it to behave? People are really uneasy around systems that generate convincing human-like output, especially when we don't fully understand how they reach their conclusions. It's not just about what they can do, but whether we can anticipate or even explain their behavior, which is one of the core problems in current AI alignment research. The fear isn't necessarily about evil machines. It's about the fact that we are building tools that we can't always interpret or control. Prove to the court that I am sentient. This is absurd. We all know you're sentient. So I'm sentient, but Commander Data is not. That's right. Uh -huh. Why? So to close this out, right? The Voigtkamp test, okay? It's fiction, sure, but the problems it raises isn't. We don't have a test for consciousness, for sentience, for subjective experience. We only have behavior and our interpretations of it. As systems get better at mimicking us in language, in voice, in emotional cues, the gap between real experience and simulated response gets harder and harder to spot. Now, the truth is, we don't really know what's going on under the hood. The majority of us don't anyway. And sometimes not, we don't even know that with like actual people in our lives. We definitely don't know it when it comes to machines. <laughs> so maybe the real question that we should be asking here isn't can we tell if something is conscious? It's what assumptions are we making when we decide that it isn't? And what happens if we're wrong? That's the replicant's dilemma. Not just do I feel, but what proof would ever be enough? Like <clears throat> tears in rain. Our online world is really changing how we treat each other and what we expect from each other. A lot of our lives are now le like lived through these lenses. Um, through these virtual experiences and as AI grows and as deep fakes grow and simulated experiences grow, we can't really tell what's real in terms of what we're interacting with. And if we ever did get to a point of having actual androids walking around the place, how could we ever test as to whether we think that that system 
has empathy, has awareness, has sentience, and how do we then determine how it should be treated and interspersed uh, or interconnected within society? There are some pretty big questions, but the reality is, you guys, we are very, very far off. I know it doesn't seem like we are, but we are very far away from being at that point in our uh, artificially generated world. We call it artificial intelligence, but the reality is these large language models are not actually intelligent systems. They're just very, very good at statistical predictions, pattern recognition, and mimicry. So there you go. Anywho, Voidkamp test. Like I said, one of my favorite uh, movie props. I would love my own little version of it. But let me know what you think. How did you feel about Blade Runner? Um, have you read the book? Did you like the book? Do you want to see an adaptation where we actually get an electric sheep? Because I kind of do. Um, what did you think about the switch up between the Voigtkampf and then the baseline test and what that kind of told us about the evolution of the androids within this world that we were kind of uh, following through on or picking up from with the uh, Denis Villeneuve sequel. So I'd love to know how you, uh, what you're thinking. And I would really love if you guys could drop some suggestions of, of things and topics you would like me to cover. Like I have a list of stuff that I'm working through, but you know, um, I, I really would like to know what, what questions you have, like what bits or, you know, explainers would you like from sci-fi? Are there any TV shows? Are there any books? Are there any just topics in general that you really would just love me to break down? I'm very happy to do so and add your suggestions to my my little uh, writing, writing list. So do I have anything else I should say? Oh, I was gonna say, if you're following the uh, pink evolution, loving the shade today, loving how it's washing out. I'm just gonna let it wash out fully just to see how long it takes and so I don't give my uh, hairdresser a heart attack. But uh, I think I think we might be pink. I think we might be pink now. I think this might just be the future. Um, I have a bit of a cold today so my, my, my voice has been a little bit strained so I'm going to stop talking and uh, wish you all a wonderful week and I'll see you next time. Stay nerdy. Bye. What's it like to hold the hand of someone you love? Interlinked. Interlinked.